So obviously this is probably uh, not something that we were ever expecting to do. Uh, we're going through some crazy times right now. So we really just wanted to get some of the, uh, the group members together and, and to just kind of talk through things. Uh, we don't have some crazy agenda on what we're going to talk about. I think it's just, just something where we can all just discuss on how we're dealing with things on what our plans are for the future. Um, obviously these are, these are times that we probably never thought we would be in. So um, if we have some input or, or just trying to stay as positive as possible um, on, on what the industry is doing right now, what you guys are doing as, as owners, as business owners and as photographers uh, to, to get through this stuff. So uh, before we get started, I, I do uh, want to introduce some of some newer faces, um, which you might not recognize. Um, so we have, obviously, we have Mike, Nicole, Garrett, Sarah, who are usually with us uh, when they're available. And But we have some new faces. We have Celia, uh, we have Lori, and we have the best looking man in North America uh, in the bottom right-hand corner there, Tony Woodark. So if you guys um, want to do a couple of introductions on who you are, uh, what your business is, um, and what, what you, uh, you're going to contribute to the, uh, the, the conversation today. So Celia, if you want to go first, I'll, I'll pick on you first since you're up there on the, on the top right hand <laughs> corner of the Brady Bunch box. First, my favorite. Hi guys, I'm Celia. Um, I am a photographer. I'm based over in Vermont, um, in the Northeast. If you guys don't know where Vermont is, lots of people ask me what state Vermont is in. Um, we're a tiny little space between New York and New Hampshire. Um, I do wedding photography and portrait work. Um, and I'm just hoping that we can all get together collectively and really just have an honest conversation about you know, what's going on right now and the things that we can look forward to. And um, hopefully we can band together as a community so we can just really help lead each other through this really tough time. And, you know, there's light at the end of the tunnel. So just keeping it positive and um, yeah. So cool. Much it. No, I, I think you said it well, light at the end of the tunnel is something that we, we forget about as a community because we're right. going through all this. We're dealing with, with cancellations, with people postponing their weddings. I've dealt with three people po postponing their weddings to 2021. So I was actually having a conversation with, with my wife, Roxanne. I said to her, well, these are, this is income that, that we were planning on. Um, so now what do we do? Uh, what happens? Uh, do we have things in the place in order to prepare for something like this from happening ever again? Or, or right now as it's happening, are we prepared enough whether it be financially or mentally, which is a, a huge part of this. Um, mm -hmm. I'm somebody that, that just to be open with you guys, I, I deal with a lot of anxiety in my everyday life, especially lately. Um, yeah. And these are things that, that we let them compound on each other and, and, and we, we, we don't really think about that light at the end of the tunnel. And, and I think this is why I wanted to do this because just to let everybody know that we're in this together that we're all going through the same thing, whether we, we have a, a million dollar business or we're just starting off um, and just to kind of help each other out. So I'm glad that you, you said those, those, uh, that light at the end of the tunnel because I think it's something that we all need to hear. So um, Lori, to my uh, left in the Brady Bunch uh, grid, if you want to give us your elevator pitch, go for it. Hi, um, I'm Lori. I am a primarily wedding photographer based out of the San Diego area. Um, as you all know, California is kind of, well, the whole West Coast kind of got hit with this first. Um, so we're definitely dealing with, I feel like the most extreme measures currently. A lot of California is actually under shelter in place lockdown. And on top of that, um, you know, March and April is kind of when our wedding season kicks off because we have really nice weather. So we run pretty much from March to November. So this is going to be a huge hit um, for our community. I know personally, I've rescheduled five weddings just between now and May 1st. So I'm glad to be a part of this conversation and talk about what we can do, especially since regionally, I think we're all in different boats. Yeah. Yeah. And I know that we've, we've talked the past few days about really specific situations that you've gone through. So, I mean, obviously if you're comfortable talking about them, then I'd like to pick your brain on, on totally. what's happened and, and how you're, you're kind of going through them, how you're dealing with them, because I think they're, 
they're things that you probably didn't think that that <laughs> that they were going to happen to you at, at any time and and i think yeah. a lot of us can resonate with that because a lot of us are going through things that if you told me a year ago that that this would be happening that there would be a pandemic that there would be an actual uh, shutdown of of the state or major parts of the country I would call you crazy because I don't, I just don't think that that would have ever happened, especially to the the extent that is happening now. So um, if you're open to talking about that, then I would love to to pick your brain totally. on how you're dealing with all that stuff. Um, and last but not least, uh, Mr. Tony Woodark, who is one of, I would probably say our, our biggest inspirations in, in this community. It's one of the most uh, team player uh, oriented persons that I've ever met in my entire life, not met, but digitally met. Uh, Nicole had the pleasure of working with him a couple of weeks ago and nothing but great things to say about him. Um, and I've always kind of looked up to him because of the community aspect and, and somebody that's always willing to share with, with, with everyone, uh, regardless of, of whether they're his followers or just anybody on an online group. So I appreciate you coming down um, and, and hanging out with us for a little bit. Wow, that is quite the intro. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, well, I look up to all you guys too. So this is awesome being here and just being able to bring some light to this community. Um, I'm Tony Woodark. I'm a wedding photographer out of Southern California. And I have a full-time job as well. So this isn't hitting me as hard currently just because I have a good job as well. So I'm in a little bit different boat than a lot of you guys um, that do this full time and rely on this for your income. So my perspective is a little different and just kind of say that as a disclaimer for the, any suggestions or comments that I have, I currently am getting paid by another company. So um, we'll see what happens, how long this lasts and everything. But um, I'm like, I did a personality test a while back for work and um, like with a psychiatrist or whatever psychologist and uh, I got like a 10 out of 10 rating on optimism and it was like, Oh, that's cool. I'm super optimistic. And he's like, Oh no, it's almost to a detriment. Like, it's <laughs> like, if you're a 10, you're almost like so optimistic that you don't see the pitfalls sometimes. And so I like to still be optimistic about that rating. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so hopefully I can just bring some energy and some optimism to you guys. And I do think that this is, going to be in the long run is going to be good for all of us just to have gone through this and I think we're going to learn a lot about ourselves set ourselves up better for the future and um, yeah I think it's going to be a good learning for everyone. Agreed and I, I one of the things that I like to talk about during our workshops is that um, or some of our workshops is that that being put in an uncomfortable situation kind of inspires growth um, for sure. and this is kind of the extreme of that but in a way I like you said I think it'll be something that that we'll all get to learn from. And it's something that, that we'll look back on and, and really probably it will play part in a, a lot of the changes that we may make uh, to, to our businesses in order to prevent anything like that from, from happening ever again, or at least not from happening, but if it does happen, we could at least be prepared. Um, I know that I talk to a lot of couples and when we talk about simple things like uh, hardware malfunction, um, what happens if I get sick? Like these are all things that I like to to talk about and end them with, well, I take these steps in case anything like that were to happen. So hopefully a year from now or even a couple of months from now, we can look back at this and and be prepared for anything like that to happen ever again. So um and I know that you have a, a marketing background if I'm if I'm not mistaken. Um so if you have any tips or anything that on I mean somebody I know that you you're very involved with with your website, educational stuff. Um, so if you have any tips or anything that you can, you can give, uh, people watching then that would be, that would be awesome. So, yeah, I mean, right off the bat, I would say that how we portray ourselves and go through this to our followers is really important. Um, I feel like there's a lot of like fear and, um, desperation and, uh, just, you know, people are scared and I get that, but I think to the best thing to do is just to be optimistic and um, just be positive to your community because it will help everyone around you. And I think people are just naturally more drawn to um, positivity rather than like someone just suffering. And uh, 
not to say that you can't suffer and you can't share that with your followers, but I, I shared something by Jai Long, um, a photographer out of, I think, Australia on my Instagram yesterday. And um, you guys should check that out if you didn't already. But it's just like a little video of him talking about kind of two different people that he worked with. And one was like this desperate guy and one was this like successful guy. And he always went out of his way to help the successful guy and didn't really help out that guy that was kind of struggling. And he like felt bad about it, but I think that's just naturally how people react and people are drawn to success. People are drawn to positivity. And so I think it's really important for us right now, as you just talk to people and you put out anything on your social media that you're positive and encouraging and, and a light at the end of the tunnel, rather than just like, I'm dying, help me, you know, I don't know. Right. Yeah. And, and that's something that I've seen lately is you see a lot of different people posting with a lot of different attitudes. Um, and I think the important thing, um, and I'll throw it back to you, uh, uh, Nicole and Mike, you guys can probably talk about what you've done in the past couple of days to, to deal with, with the situation and how you've communicated with your couples. But, but it is something to, that, that speaks a lot about not only uh, your character, but the way that you, you run your business. So my, my understanding is that if, you're right. If, if you are positive about the things that, that you're, that you're going through, or at least you, you show people that there's hope at the, at the end of the tunnel, or there's light at the end of the tunnel, then I think it makes a much bigger difference in the way that they react to things. Um, not necessarily going online. And, um, I've always been a, I haven't been a fan of, of the whole, um, uh, almost like, uh, like everything is, is somebody else's fault or, or, or I'm blaming something else uh, for for my failures, or just somebody with with the attitude that that nothing is their fault. So if you go online and you and you and you complain about ten different things without really showing any hope that that, that things are going to get better, I think I think it does project onto not only your followers but people that may have hired you for their wedding. So uh, um, you're absolutely yeah, to, right about that. To touch on that, I think that it's really important that even if you're not as sure about the future like none of us are right now um that if you're showing to your clients and your followers and the people that you interact with daily that you're looking for active solutions on what's going to happen next and kind of making a game plan um that goes a lot further than sinking into sort of the wallowing and negative response. Um, I always like to think that our confidence really gives our clients more confidence in us. Sorry, my phone just started ringing. Um, so um, so by projecting that we have a plan and that we're going to make things work and that we know just as little as everybody else, um, I think people are more receptive to you and your suggestions and maybe whatever ideas you have to make things work. So maybe they do rebook another wedding with you or find a date that you're available and really want to work with you and make sure that you two are still on the same page as far as your contracts. Right. Yeah. Um, Sila, do you have anything to add? I know that you have raised your hand. <laughs> Um, yeah, just touching base on what Nicole said, I think what we need to remember is, is that we are, we are the professionals, we're the experts in, in this field. So I think it's important to remember to have the conversations with our clients um, before they even ask us. And because we know that these conversations are going on in their heads. I mean, if it's going on in our heads and everyone else around us, we know that our brides and grooms and our clients are already having this conversation. So what we can do is we can become a resource to them, reach out, say, Hey, we are the professionals. You trust us. You trusted us to book us for your event. So how can I help guide you? How can I show up for you? How can I still serve you in this indefinite time? And, and help lead you to a way that um, is gonna be a little bit more reassuring. So I, I totally agree with what Nicole is saying in, in that sense, um, to just be sure that we're having those conversations. And I think it's just really important to do it before they start approaching us, because I think it's gonna give them some sense of reassurance. Like, okay, here's another person who's a professional in their field that can reach out, lead us by the hand, be like, hey, this is how I can help you through this. Um, I think it could definitely take a lot of the anxiety out of the situation. I think as we as vendors or professionals have a lot of anxiety, but you know, these brides and grooms are also spending a lot of money. They're looking at possibly losing a lot of money. This is a big deal to them. So um, 
I think just remembering in that sense too is really important. So yeah. That's and, that's and I agree. Sorry. I think being proactive is definitely something that you need to do. If you haven't reached out to your couples, I mean, the minute that, that this ends or even now, just go out and send out a quick email and just say, Hey, listen, I just want to, I know that, that in our private group chat, uh, Garrett, you, you said something that, that is so true is just start the line of communication to, to let them know that you're there for them. Even if, if it's on short times, you know, if you don't know what's going to happen, just even the idea of you reaching out to them is going to put them at ease in a way. It's just telling them that you're willing to help out, help them out as much as possible. I actually just got a message from a couple that I, I emailed and in their last email, I'm going to read it to you guys. So very quick, it says, thank you for checking in. Uh, we're wishing the best for you and all other small businesses. Can't imagine how difficult this must be for all of you guys. And, and just the fact that I reached out to them, I said, Hey, listen, we're all kind of suffering. Um, but I want to be here for you guys. And I, and I want to go through all the steps and I know that it must be frustrating for you. Um, and it's also frustrating for me, but if we work together, then we can, we can come to a compromise. We can, we can figure out a date for you if you have to re, um, uh, reschedule anything. So, so that's, I'm glad that you brought that up because that's one of the things I wanted to talk about is just really taking the initiative to reach out to your couples before, because I know that I used to do this all the time where I would just, I would keep quiet and I would wait for my issues to come up and then I dealt with them. So really putting your foot down and dealing with, with the, a potential issue before uh, it's, it's, uh, it's communicated by another party that I think is, is big, a big. Absolutely. At least. Um, and that, so. that helps to alleviate some of that anxiety too. Cause if, if you have all this fear and anxiety building up, like what is my couple thinking? I, I don't know what's going on. I don't know if they're thinking about rescheduling or canceling. If you open that line of communication, you can have a conversation about it. Even if you don't have a solution right away, you can at least start the conversation. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, Lori, you, yeah, do you have something to add? About- I know that you have your, your, you know. Oh yeah. I was just going to say that. Um, I, I mean, I agree with everyone obviously, and it's crazy to say this now, but I actually sent out emails, I think on Monday, which feels like it was forever ago, um, even though it was just Monday and like so much has already changed. Um, but me and some of my friends all sent out like a canned email via HoneyBook. Um, I sent it out till up to my July wedding. So all my April, May and June brides got it. And I haven't heard back from my June or most of my May ones yet. Um, but April was kind of the like 911. Um, and everyone was so appreciative. And I actually have retained all five of those weddings. And I think it's because of being proactive. Um, that it helped me communicate with them and they chose dates almost based on my availability, obviously their venue too, but a lot of them seem to say like, you know, I'm so thankful you were like so proactive and we want to keep you on board. And I am hearing stories from other vendors saying like couples are choosing dates without telling them. And I know that's upsetting, but they're in such chaos mode right now that for them to reach out to all their vendors is probably hard. And that's another reason why we need to be the ones stepping up and making that first point of contact with them. Right. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. Um, Nicole, I know if you want to say something, if you guys want to just touch on what you specifically did with your couples, because you did something that I, I, I kind of wish I did before I emailed everybody else. So um, just let us know what, what you, you and Mike did. If Mike, if um, you want to add to that. Uh, yeah, so Mike and I crafted um, just kind of more of like a bulletin style newsletter that we sent out to all of our couples instead of really pinpointing the ones that might be at risk. Um, we felt that this was going to be the best method. I know I talked about this a couple days ago as well, um, but we thought that was going to be kind of the most friendly, non-threatening approach to reaching out to everybody. So it was just kind of the same message to everybody, whether they're getting married in December or they're getting married in May. Um just letting them know that we're going to be honoring our contracts and that we're going to be flexible. Like their money's not going anywhere. We're not going anywhere and that we have backups available. If you know, there is the worst case scenario where one of us actually gets sick as well. Um, and we kind of touched on everything in more of a positive manner. I was going to suggest, I don't know if everybody's comfortable sharing, but maybe we can kind of start a thread of um, kind of communications that we're having with our clients as you know kind of reaching out to them as this is all going on so maybe people who might have some struggles crafting an email that they think is going to be positive and enlightening as well as like reinforcing maybe we can kind of get something going so we'll have a resource for that yeah yeah mike do you have anything to add to what 
what Nicole just said. I know that you guys are a team. So, yeah, I think it's just um, the one thing to note too is keeping the tone kind of positive, upbeat, and not so doom and gloom. Um, one note Nicole added, I think, was a nice touch at the end. It was stay in touch, but not too close. <laughs> just kind of adding like <laughs> a little humor to it, um, you know, making as light of the situation as you can. But again, just being the first person to reach out is super important and shows you really care about them. You know, they're going through some serious shit. So as we all are, yeah. this is their yeah. wedding. So totally agree. Sarah, have you, um, have you had any situations happen? I know you're in a different part of our country, but, um, but have you, how, how does the, how does this whole thing look like where you are? I think you're muted. I can unmute you. There we go. Uh, first of all, Missouri is not as proactive as I personally think they should be. But um, okay. so nothing's really um, a force shut down right now. But personally, my situation is a little different than everybody else's because as you guys know, we're expecting. So I didn't book a whole lot wedding wise. Um, I did have a couple of events that have rescheduled just because they feel like it's the right thing to do. But otherwise, it's mostly seniors and family. And uh, at this point, I'm kind of just letting them, letting them decide because most of what I do is like outdoors in the country so I can keep a distance. I can shout my prompts to them. But otherwise, yeah, any big events pretty much that are in my foreseeable future are, are pushed back. And I appreciate that they're doing that. Yeah. Uh, Tony, do you have any, have you run into a situation where you've had to postpone anything? I know that you said that this isn't your full-time job, but. Yeah. Um, the only one I've had to postpone there, I have two in May that will probably end up being postponed, but. Um, is your thing, sorry. Is it, did not go on? That's all right. I can just jump to it. Oh yeah. Yeah. You're good. You're back. Sorry. Um, and then in October, because Coachella moved all the, I have a wedding in Palm Springs and all the wedding, the hotel prices went up to like over a thousand dollars. And so I had a couple in October that moved their wedding date because they didn't want it overlapping with Coachella because it would cost all their guests thousands of dollars. Um, yeah. so the bummer in that one was they moved to Halloween, which I had, previously not booked because I have two kids, but oh, I just yeah. made the sacrifice. And so I'm going to miss Halloween with my kids, which is a huge bummer. And it's like saddening, but it's like, that's one thing that I can do for my couple. So I'm doing it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and like I said, this is something that it's not going to happen every year, hopefully. Um, right. So it is one of those situations where, I mean, obviously I have a wedding on Halloween, but if I, if I typically don't take Halloween weddings, I don't take on New Year's weddings, at least for the past couple of years. Um, but yeah, you're right. I mean, if, if, if it's a situation like this, and I think this it's year. probably, yeah, I know, which is fine because they're two awesome weddings. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, if, if, if I was in that position, I could definitely see why, why it would be, I would have to make an exception for something like this. So um, I do want to read some of the comments. Um, let's see. Oh man, there's a ton of comments. Uh, so great that you guys are doing this and discussing the struggles. It helps to know people we look up to are struggling just the same as we are. Yeah, we're like I said, we're all in this together. Uh, we're all we're all going through the same thing. Like I said, regardless of of who we are. Um, I mean, I was just in a in a, uh, a closed discussion with some of the Magma ambassadors, um, and some of the people that I look up to um, um, are are saying the same thing. And and sometimes you 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 look at these people and you and you say, wow, that's I would have never thought that that so and so would be struggling right now, and and they are because it, it overall as the industry as an industry we're all kind of struggling because we don't we don't really we've never gone through this before. So, um, Nicole, did you? Oh, sorry, yeah, let's go to Nicole. So I know that you you had something to add to the conversation. So if you want to go ahead, go for it. I'll read some of the comments here while you're doing that. Oh wait, what what did I have to add to the conversation? I oh, know you have your your hand raised. Oh, because I didn't you have lower to my put hand, your hand after last. Don't forget <laughs> to lower your hand. You Sarah, me. did you I'm lower so your hand? I'm so sorry. Do nope. you have something to add? No, then just lower your hand so that I know that you don't have anything to add to the Nobody watching knows what lowering your hand <laughs> means because we're not sitting here like this. 
I did have a question for you guys sure. since I am in a place where, you know, they haven't put those standards into place yet, at least not officially where they've banned any gatherings over say 50 or so. Um, what would you say to those people that do have some of those coming up? Like I had a week or a wedding last weekend, which I did, I was obligated to cover. Um, and that was, you know, like, like you guys were saying earlier, it's changed so much just over the course of even a week that it it's not being taken as seriously, but I imagine it's going to keep progressing. What would you say to those people? Because I've seen those questions asked a few times in this group and other groups. Um, say you do have a wedding coming up that's not canceled, but you feel highly uncomfortable going, like, how would you handle that? How would you proceed? Uh, does anyone want to take on the answer? I can, I can answer how I would answer, okay. or you guys, go ahead, Lori. Um, I was just going to say that I feel so bad for everyone that's posting this. I feel so lucky that we actually have mandates in place because personally, if I were in your situation, what a terrible place to be in as a business owner. It's like, we are risking upsetting our clients on one hand, but then like the health and safety of our family on the other hand. And not only that, but I have very strong feelings about this whole situation. So the fact that people are like continuing with events is like driving me crazy. Cause I'm like, please yeah. just postpone it. Like it's just time. But I think at the end of the day, it comes down to like your health needs to be the most important and it sucks to lose the money and it sucks to upset a client. But if you get sick, you're no good to anyone you know, in the future with your clients, it's, it's not worth it. That would be my personal feelings, even though it would be really hard. I agree. And I do kind of wonder, which I know none of us are lawyers, but I do kind of wonder if um, canceling on those grounds are kind of underneath the act of God clause in your contract. I feel um, like does something it count like that as, would be. I know in our contract, we have something that basically just says that if Mike and I are unable to complete a wedding and I think it's kind of a vague it doesn't say like act of God or serious illness or anything like that it's just like if we're unable to that we're just contractually obligated to find somebody to fill our role um, mm -hmm. so I'm not sure if that actually covers us or if anybody has any input on that but I know that that is something that we keep in our contract just in situations where like this year I got asked to be a bridesmaid on a day that we already had a wedding um, so Mike was able to reach out to the couple and let them know that we're finding somebody else to cover and they were totally fine with it and we're covered by our contract as well. Yeah. So, so just to add to that, um, I know that my contract doesn't cover anything specific to what's going on right now. And again, it's something that not a lot of us expect it to happen. Uh, my contract does cover me in case I I'm unable to perform any duties during the wedding. So if I get sick, if I get into a car accident, um, again, the act of God is there, but again, there's so there's so many questions surrounding the specific situation that's happened right now that I personally don't know. I, I don't know how to answer that. Um, I mean, we can try to do some research and get back to you. I'm sure it's been asked before. Uh, but um, there is there is a whole uh, safety clause in my contract, where if I feel unsafe to perform the duties that are, are asked of me, then I can step back. But then again, that gets into a, a, a it probably would get into a back and forth with my couples and I where where I feel unsafe going into your wedding because I'm potentially being put at risk. I know that my, my mother actually lives with me and with us and, and she's 70 years old. So if I go to a wedding with 200 guests and, and I can potentially bring something back into my house, um, then I'd rather not do that, obviously. So I, I personally wouldn't take on a wedding, even if there wasn't any, any law or any specific ban in my area. Uh, because I know that if I come back home and I'm putting my mother at risk, somebody that just had surgery last year, somebody that's gone through a couple of, of, of health scares in the past year, actually a year, exactly a year, um, then yeah, I personally wouldn't do it. Um, obviously, financially speaking, it would suck because now I have to put, it, put myself in a position where I, I'm going to say, well, am I going to refund the money uh, because I'm stepping out of the wedding? Uh, even though there's no ban. So technically, am I, am I liable for return of the retainer? Um, so those are things that you probably end up, end up going through. But personally, my answer would be no, I, I wouldn't take on the wedding because I know that I would be putting somebody that's near and dear to my heart at risk. So um, that's what I would do. Um, Lori, did you have something to add to that? Um, yeah, I was just going to say that, you know, on top of the safety factor, I think it's also important to be very honest with our clients. And if they bring this up, say, 
you know, just because there's not a ban on Tuesday doesn't mean that by Saturday there isn't going to be a ban because things have been changing so fast here, at least in California. I mean, we went from 250 to 50 to 10 to some places on literally shelter in place restrictions all within this last week. So I don't think there's anything wrong with saying to your client, like, hey, things are like happening very rapidly. Like, can we have an honest conversation about what that means if we get to Saturday and they are saying you cannot have your event with more than 50 people because at that point I'm not going to break the law because I'm contractually obligate, obligated to photograph a wedding. Yeah. Yeah. No, well, I, I would assume I totally that our agree. contracts kind of like you can't contractually have anything that is illegal. Does that make sense? So if you have a contract in place that obligates you to doing something that is illegal, that contract is void. So yeah, but I, I think the question was more toward like if there isn't any actual ban on the location oh, that you're shooting. Yeah. Um, and and then you feel that you yeah, might. But, yeah. No, but I mean, as far as what Lori was just saying about how we don't know if something changes and there is a ban in place, can your clients expect you to uphold your contract? Oh, okay. Gotcha. Yeah. I don't, uh, Esteban, I don't know how to raise my hand. I missed that <laughs> part, but I just want to add. Um, I would, I would come up with solutions and bring solutions and options to your client. You know, I would come to, I would have an honest conversation with them and say, Hey, I'm not comfortable or I'm still on the fence. I need to see what's going to happen, but here are some options for you. And either it's someone who's open to shooting that date or, um, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I would come to them with options though, before I even had the conversation, I would have some different options and I would talk to the couple and then I would know what my contract says in case it comes to legal matters. But in my case, like I'm going to, I'm not going to ever go to a lawsuit with my couples, you know, like I'm never going to go to that extreme. Like I would just forfeit my money and, and move on. And so um, I think just having a solution that makes sense for you and would be a acceptable one for them is probably the best way to approach it and come to them first. Right. Yeah, no, I agree. And and a lot of the time when it, even if, if it's not the specific situation, if there's any situation where we might not be able to go to a wedding, what's the first thing that we typically do is we, we come up with solutions and we say, Hey, listen, I, I don't know, this happened. I can't make the wedding. These are the options that you have. Um, and just, I think having the same approach will, will go a long way. And, and, and I've never, I, obviously I can't speak for everyone. Um, but I've never really hired a couple that that weren't open to to talking about me trying to help them out. Um, sure. I've never met anybody that that if something happened um, that I felt that they would automatically go to something like like a lawyer. I know there are people out there. I know that that it's happened before. Um, but again, I feel like those are those are s such a small part of of the equation in the industry. Uh, but usually, they are the one of the loudest voices and the groups and stuff so it's, you kind of tend to get scared about that stuff so and that's when we go back to to ignoring things and just waiting for things to play out when in reality we should do what you were saying is just really coming up with solutions and 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 giving them the option of of um of what what you can do to help them out so um yeah yeah that's 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 definitely what what i think would be would be a good good way to deal with it. So, um, I do want to move on to a couple of other things that I know that we, we talked about earlier, um, is, is dealing with downtime and dealing with, with what we're doing with our time right now. How can we be proactive? How can we be productive with our time? Um, does anybody have anything to that, that they can, they can give some of the viewers some, some, uh, ideas on, on, on what we're doing. Celia, do you want to, do you want to add to that? Yeah, um, I think that right now we're all kind of forced into this weird, awkward downtime, the season where typically we'd probably be ramping up for a busy season, but because of what's going on, we're all kind of just forced to hunker down and stay in our homes. And I know that can cause a lot of anxiety. I know for me, I was like, you know, because of some circumstances that have happened in my own personal life, my work from last year kind of got pushed back a couple of months. So I have things that I need to get done, but just in the long haul, like 
let's think of things that we can do with, you know, I, I hesitate to say gift of time, but really it is, you know, we're sitting here, we can't leave our homes, or at least we shouldn't. Um, what can we do? And, and, you know, we can ask ourselves, I watched this live the other night that was so inspirational. It really gave me a lot of insight to like, what we can, what we can do, how, how can we still add value? Like, how can we still serve our clients? How can we still serve our audience and the people that we love while we are in this in between season? And, um, I think that a lot of us can really dig in deep and, you know, really think about what things can we do, you know, so we can start thinking about is our, our websites up to date? Can we update, you know, our social media platforms? Can we start preparing ourselves with a better workflow for when our busy season is going to be here? Because let's be honest, everyone's stuck inside. No one can go anywhere. No one can do anything. The light at the end of the tunnel, when this is over, people are going to be excited. They're going to be energetic. They're going to be ready to get out and to book sessions and reschedule weddings and get out and be social. And we are going to be busy. And we just have to remember that aspect that right now it's scary and we don't have any business, but this is not going to last forever. So how can we go about preparing ourselves for the busy that's going to come now while we have this downtime? And I think that there's a lot of things that we can be doing with that. Um, you know, and like I said, like, let's look at our website. I know for me, like I'll put my website up and I got a lot of great photos and I have some texts and I feel great about it. And then like a year and a half later, I'm like, Shh, like I have not updated my website. Like my photos are so old. Like the things that I'm talking about aren't even up to date. Like let's use this time to like really refresh what we have in front of us. Um, even like, you know, can we start preparing blogs ahead of time? I know that sounds kind of weird, but like, you know, weddings that we have that maybe we know some of their backstories. Can we start preparing workflows to help alleviate the busy that's going to happen to us on the other end of this? Because we know that's going to happen, right? You know, maybe doing, yeah. um, I just think that there is so much that we can cultivate in this downtime. Um, and just, and just trying to remember, like we've been talking about, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Let's just keep focused on that. We are not all going to be out of business forever. It's scary, but there's a lot of things that we can do to prepare ourselves for when the clients really start pouring in. So. Yeah, I completely agree. And I, I love that, that you, you're talking about doing things other than just photography. I'm actually going to read Steve, one, my friend, Steve Walters, uh, status that he posted the other day I actually posted in the group and it says take this time to find a hobby or pursue a passion pick up that guitar get those paints out design the contraption or just update your website use this time to create not just memes don't spend all your time creating memes they're funny and all but but don't don't spend the entire time creating them and innovate and inspire so uh whether and, and inspiring could be such a a different side of things. I mean, it could be something as small as just if you have kids, like just take them out for a walk in nature, just go outside and play with them, draw with them. Um, it doesn't have to be all directly connected to photography or, 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 or being a business owner. Um, go out and inspire yourself, go out and take a walk in nature. One of the things that I saw earlier today is that it was a photo of somebody just in complete nature. And it said, um, that COVID-19 is not in this location. So, so just really kind of going out and, and, um, and just being inspired by nature. Obviously you want to make sure that you take precautions with if you're going out, but, um, but just little things like that. I think it's just important to, to realize that not everything has to be, if you have two, three weeks off, don't spend the entire time focusing on just work, just really focus on, on things like, like family and, and just being outside and just getting your mind, uh, putting it at ease. Um, I know that the past couple of days I've really focused on, on, on creating or documenting life with my kids at home. And if you guys follow me on Instagram, I posted a bunch of photos from the other day. Um, and those are things that, that kind of keep me at ease where I I'll create and just creating in a way that it's not necessarily just, just wedding related. I think it just really, it's helped me out a lot. So um, Tony, I know you, you had something to add to that. So if you want to jump in. Yeah. Uh, I love all that. I think all that's like 
super good. I think a lot of people right now are just worried about like finances, you know, like, okay, I can do work on my website. I can uh, go outside. I can have fun or whatever, but I need to pay bills. And to that, I would say there's, there's a ton of different things you can do. But one thing that when I do mentorships with uh, photographers and I ask them about prints, most people don't have like a print process in place and they don't sell albums or they've just been overwhelmed and they don't want to worry about that or whatever. And I would say use this time to figure out some sort of method to create albums and sell prints. Um, because that's some money that you could be making. I think there's a lot of, um, it's hard. Like if you're a photographer and you're trying to make money off the photography community right now, everyone's kind of like holding on to their wallet cause they're a little worried, but there's plenty of people out there that still have jobs, still have money. And if you reached out to them with like a printing solution and said, Hey, this is one way you can support my small business. Um, I'm launching prints and here's 20% off just to get you inspired or whatever. There's a ton of money to be made. I made, you know, over $10,000 last year, just off prints. And I don't even, I don't do that much weddings, you know? And so there's a lot of money to be made. Um, and so I would say, figure that out. Um, just one other thing that I've, I just did today was, um, I have another friend who's on the East coast, who's a photographer. And I was talking to him about film cameras just cause I love shooting film and he and I are swapping cameras and Esteban, mm. I'm sorry, it's X fan. Come on. <laughs> I know. You can't say but, that in my group. What's wrong with you? <laughs> but I basically, I just took a camera and, and shipped it to him and he's taking his camera and shipping it to me and we're just going to use each other's, I'll wipe it off and sanitize it, but uh, <laughs> we're just going to be able to play with each other's cameras. And that's like, to me, a new camera is like one of the most inspirational things to like want to go shoot. And so yeah. I think that just connecting with someone on that level of like, you know, sharing something that's personal to us. And then also just like getting a camera to get inspired. I think those are just two like easy things that I'm doing right now. And then I would say to the social media, like, I think it's really easy to get sucked into like reading headlines and reading like sitting on Instagram, like I've seen a lot of people share like, oh, I got to the end of Instagram, you know? And it says like, you have no more new posts. Like that mm -hmm. scares me. And like, I can easily get sucked into that. But I would say something that I've done a lot this past year is, is spend a lot less time on Instagram and a lot more time on YouTube. And because I feel like when I sit on YouTube, like I get inspired and I get education like i watch a lot of different people that are like gear reviews or tips on shooting or anything that's like i'm interested in when i'm on youtube i'm like i'm getting educated and i'm like when i set down my phone i'm like okay i know this now i want to try that when i set down my phone after like being on instagram i'm just i i can barely tell you like five photos that i saw and or anything that I learned, you know, it just kind of, I feel like Instagram to me is a, a lot of mind numbing information or a lot of mind numbing, just photos and people just kind of like, I don't know. I don't want to talk crap on Instagram because that's where primarily most of my business comes from. So there's definitely good parts about it, but I'd say YouTube from like an education standpoint is way more inspiring. And so I'm just trying to focus free time and I need to just like relax. I'll go on YouTube rather than Instagram. So, yeah. And don't, don't go on TikTok because then yeah no. then you just spend TikTok. hours I'm too, I'm too on... old for tiktok i think i get banned <laughs> if i try to go on tiktok <laughs> um but you're absolutely right i think i think while this is happening while we are kind of suffering as an industry i think there's still money to be made i think there there's still different opportunities that we we have not everyone is in the same situation that that we are uh that we're in not everyone is in the same industry so um, just being going about it in the right way, I think is important. I know that I've seen a couple of like sales that don't necessarily, they're not necessarily how I would um, offer them to people, especially in the wording. Um, but again, I mean, for, so for example, one of the things that I did this year is like, I really cut back on the amount of weddings that I, I do so that I could focus on workshops. And now this happens. So now I'm, I'm saying to myself, well, what, I only took on so many weddings um, because I was depending on the workshops. Now that I can't, I don't know when I'm going to be able to announce new workshops. Um, what can I do? So, so again, as you guys probably already saw, I'm going to be offering one-on-one -on -one mentoring sessions um, and they're going to be done online, which is something that I've, I've never done other than, than some of the uh, previous attendees for my workshops. Um, but again, there's people out there that are willing to invest in their education. So as a, an educator, I, I want to take advantage of it.
But again, I want to go about it in the right way as opposed to um, offering these uh, insensitive sales that a lot of people are, are posting. So um, I do want to read one question that I think uh, was, was important. Uh, Justin asked, what's everyone doing with rescheduling? Uh, new contracts with a new date, uh, a form acknowledging the date change and transfer of deposit. So what I'm doing with my three couples is I'm just canceling that contract um, and I'm re I'm doing a cancellation contract with all three of them. And then I'm, I'm just building in a completely new contract for 2021 under the same pricing that I offered them originally. So my pricing would have changed for, for next year, but I'm honoring uh, this year's prices. So I don't know if you guys have anything to, if you guys have any other ways of doing that. I know that there's certain like transfer uh, uh, contracts or wording that you can put in there, but I would rather just cancel the contract um, and then just honor the same pricing and then just uh, just do a completely new contract with a new date, same price. Um, so. Well, in um, HoneyBook, if you use HoneyBook, it allows you to like edit the contract and then send like a version two. So that's what I've been doing with my couples when I'm rescheduling okay. them. I'm updating the project details with their new date. Um, I, it still has like the payment marked that way. It's not going to record like a double payment. And cause I use HoneyBook to track my profit and expenses for the year too. Um, okay. so it won't mark a double payment and then it sends it to the client and they have to just accept the changes and it records that they've like accepted it. And I just write, I'm, updating the contract because some of my contracts are so old that my contract has changed a little bit. So I'm just like, you can add in like your most up-to-date version of your contract. And then when I email it out to my couples, I just let them know like, Hey, this is like a new version of my contract. So please just like read through it before you accept it. Like it's not major differences, but if you have a question, you can of course ask me and I haven't had any issues with that. And then it just like pops it onto the right date after. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, Nicole, I know you had your hand up. I don't know if you wanted to add to that or anything that we were talking about beforehand. Uh, you're muted. Okay. I had my hand up for like five minutes ago, oh, sorry. which was just uh, in regards to sales and stuff like that. I was going to ask because I've been feeling really icky about trying to offer things for people to purchase. And I'm not sure if that's just like my own sort of um, apprehension getting in the way because I feel like knowing how I'm struggling, like, you know, the restaurant that I work at just shut down and all that, like I'm out of a job possibly too, out of my non-photography jobs. Um, so like, I'm not looking for things to buy right now. And I kind of assume that my clients are in the same boat. Um, but I wasn't sure if people have found success. I know Tony, you're saying that you have in the past. I'm just not sure if that's like during this pandemic, but I haven't been able to get over my own apprehension of like, trying to get people to purchase something at a time like this, even though I know it's going to help our business, if that makes any sense. I, I mean, I think, I, I think, like I said before, it's really about the way that you approach it. Um, and again, you shouldn't, if you have the opportunity to make extra money, I mean, this is just from my perspective, if, if you have the opportunity to make extra money um, and just, don't think that everybody's in the same situation. So if somebody's is going to, if you're going to offer them an incentive to purchase something, if they're in a, a much better position, if they're working from home, they're still making the same amount of money. Um, and you shot their wedding last year and you say, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to do a 20% off uh, albums or something. Um, they're going to look at that as an incentive to purchase an album if they were thinking about it. So um, I don't, I, I again, I, I don't, I want to make sure that that the, these things are communicated in the right way as opposed to um, in a insensitive way. Um, but um, I Celia, I don't know some if you... Sort of... Oh, sorry. No, just touching um, on your point, Nicole, because I know sometimes I think as artists, we like hesitate. We don't want to feel like, I don't know, like we're begging or gimmicky, like, you know, hey, like, come buy these things from me because we're all having a really hard time. I think we can kind of struggle with that. But I think um, like what Esteban was saying is that not everyone is in the same situation. And I think that people want to help. And even if it's not a lot, I think sometimes, and I know at least for me, I have a really hard time just in anything like asking for help and accepting help. But I think once we can open up as a collective and understand that like as a community, like I'm sure you guys have seen that Mr. Rogers meme where 
he said he used to see scary things on the news and his mom said, always look for the helpers. There are always helpers. There are helpers out there and people want to know how to support you and support us as small businesses, but they don't know how to do that. And people aren't going to search for ways to do that. So I think being really honest, being open and saying, Hey, you know, like I run a small business times are, you know, really unsure and unscary right now. Um, you know, here are some ways that you can help, you know, and it can be a simple list for people because people like to know what they need to do. People need to be told what to do really, you know, Hey, you can just simply share this post. You can buy a gift certificate. You can just share about other small businesses. I think if we can just unapologetically kind of just get out there and just say, Hey, you know, like these are ways that you can support me or other small businesses. I, I think people want to help and the people that can help will help. Um, and also I don't want to take up too much time, but also on Tony's point about, um, just really being resourceful. So the whole, the print shop, that's something that I've thought about so much, like all of my travels, like New Zealand and England and all these places. I'm like, I have all these great photos, but all this time where like, you're so busy. And for me, I have like all these ideas and things that I want to do, but I never get around to them. I think this is going to push us as artists to be more resourceful, finding income in other ways than just being one-on-one -on -one doing photo shoots. And I think that that's really important because I think what this time right now is going to teach us is, okay, obviously things in life are going to happen that we can't ever, you know, plan for unexpected shit happens. And how are we taking care of ourselves and our business? That's also taking care of our families later on down the line. And when this first happened, I was like, shit, what, what am I going to do? My backup plan was I could always bartend or wait tables because that's what I did for 15 years. I got it. You know, that was always my backup. But now that the restaurants and bars are closed, I'm like, I literally, I don't have a backup. Weddings are going to reschedule or cancel. Like it's a really, it could be a really scary thing, but I think this will push us, you know, A, to be more resourceful. Think of other ways that we can, you know, we can be, we can make money with our passion and our art. And yeah, I'm rambling, but I, I definitely wanted to hit on those couple of points because I feel really passionate about those. Things. No, I, I think, I think you're absolutely right. And I, I don't think that we should be afraid to, to offer our, our couples or clients um, the option of spending money if they have it, um, if it's done in the right way. So, um, yeah. So, Lori, go, go for it if you want to jump in. Um, so I actually was surprised that I got inquiries this week. I didn't expect to get them, but people are still inquiring. I got inquiries both for sessions. I got one for a 2020 wedding. I'm obviously I've kind of frozen my booking at this point because I'm trying to focus on my couples that I need to postpone. Um, but I even booked a 2021 wedding. So people are still planning. They are still booking. They actually, I mean, if they have the money now they have the time. So this is when they're scrolling and looking, you know, for vendors and things like that. There are people that have secure jobs that don't have to worry about the money aspect. I live in a really big military town. Obviously those jobs are secure. Those people um, are still, planning their weddings for next year. And I think people that are getting married in 2021, this is like not on their mind at all really at this point. So don't be afraid to continue promoting yourself and doing that because the inquiries are going to come. So. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah, was just going to say, sorry to that same okay. point that um, Nicole and Celia were saying, I think it's easy to kind of get stuck in the same mindset of like, whatever you're in. Cause I'm in that same position, Nicole, where we're, we're not looking to do any extra spending. I mean, we were already in stork mode before this, but I have seen plenty of people, multiple people actually on my feed that have been going around trying to support their local artists, um, buying things like gift certificates for tattoo shops and other places like that. So I think the opportunity is there. It just, some other people might where we're not looking to spend because we're in that position where we're losing the majority of our income. There are some people that have money that is saved and now they have nowhere to go, nothing to do. And I mean, they might be open to supporting you if you just put it out there. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. All right. So let's talk about, uh, there's another thing that I wanted to touch on. Um, supporting other small businesses, which we obviously talked about. Um, I know that I saw a couple of uh, Instagram stories of people going into local businesses and, and, and tagging them. Um, I saw the whole Instagram thing where people were, I'm not really sure how it works, but I know that I got tagged in it a couple of times where 
uh, they tagged a couple of businesses and they just kind of shared it. So uh, little things like that. Um, obviously it, that'll help just spread the word, um, especially on social media, which is pretty much the only thing that we have going on right now. Um, so as far as another thing that I want to talk is the best practices for the business in the future, uh, and just making sure that we're prepared for anything, anything in the future. So are you guys, um, how are you guys, uh, uh, preparing for anything like that? I know that obviously these are weird times, but, but how are we, how are we, uh, positioning our business for anything like that, that may, that may happen in the future. So. I think like having, I stress this a lot in my education with mentorships and stuff is knowing your cost of doing business and knowing your budget, like personal and business budget. And I think it's really important to know like what your run rate is, like how, how much money it costs you every month to run your business. And if there's anything discretionary in your budget currently that you can remove for temporarily to reduce your budget and just kind of relieve stress, like maybe you don't need a Netflix uh, account or maybe you don't need Spotify or, you know, just some of these kind of like nicer amenities that we probably are spending money on monthly. Um, maybe right now you want to cancel those things and so you can just lower your, um, your budget and make it just easier on yourself. Um, so I think knowing that is really important, just knowing, okay, it costs me X amount of dollars every month to run my business. And then having that nest egg of like three months, six months, um, a year, whatever that is. I think a lot of us, you know, are just stressed out because maybe you didn't have three months or six months or a year's worth of money just stowed away in case something like this happens. And so let's get through right now, but then let's save for the future so that when something like this happens again, you know, it could be a totally different circumstance. You know how many months you have cushion before things start getting really serious. And it, it allows you to work out of a less, like a more comfortable space rather than being stressed and desperate. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And I know that, uh, uh, Garrett, you're, you're big on, on, uh, I know I, I see Mike smiling, but you're big on Dave Ramsey. And as much as I like to make fun of you, I think it's something, this is a situation where, where you're probably looking back at it and going, yeah, well, this is what I'm talking about all the time where we, we need to be financially uh, stable enough to be able to go through a situation like this. Um, and, and again, as much as, much as I, I make fun of you about it, I think, I think it's true. And I think we, we need to put ourselves in this. In a, in a situation where we're not really struggling as much um, by building that that emergency fund. So I don't know if you want to touch on on any of this, Dave Ramsey. Just don't go on for an hour because I will mute all of you and I will close out the group. I, I will not have it. You're muted. I uh, yeah, I totally agree with that. Um, and exactly what Tony said, leaning out your budget, um, trying to get out of debt and, and saving up an emergency fund of six months of expenses. So you have that in cash in the bank helps you prepare for a situation like this. And it allows you to make level headed decisions, um, and not decisions based out of fear and anxiety and desperation. Um, but now is obviously is the worst time to, to figure that out. So people need solutions, how to improve their situation now. So you can, um, I saw someone shared, you can get Adobe for two months free. You can get uh, Pixie set for two months free. You can reach out to a lot of your um, people that you, that you work with and they'll, they'll give you a little reprieve for a couple months because everyone knows we're all hurting here. Um, so there's a couple things you can do now. Maybe you set up a, a discount for, for 2021 couples because maybe 500 cash now means more to you than a thousand next year. So maybe you do a 30% discount for weddings that book and pay a deposit now for next year. So there's, there's options you can do to improve your situation now um, to help increase your, your pile of cash to help ride this storm out. Yeah. No, I, I, I think that's, that's definitely, again, like you said, it's probably too late now to, to, to do anything about it now. But again, like we're talking about just dealing with it in the future, then you want to make sure that you put yourself in a position where you're not going to go through the frustrations of, 
So, I mean, it's, it's frustrating regardless, but, but I definitely think it's, uh, it's something that, that people can, can learn from. Um, and talking finances isn't the, uh, the easiest thing in the world, especially talking to a bunch of people that you don't really know. But, but again, I think it's, um, it'll go far to just kind of read up on, on, on stuff like this, like what you kind of preach all the time. Um, so, uh, Nicole, I know that, uh, I do want to touch on, on some of the, uh, the, the assistance programs that, that people are making available. I know that Facebook has one. I know that you're a uh, local, um, either uh, state or, or federal, uh, grants. So, but before we yeah. do that, I know that, uh, uh, Lori, did you have something to, to add? Oh, I was just going to say real quick, like for the future, I feel like this is an important time to think about our retainers and maybe holding on to those until the job is completed, which I know is really hard to do, but there might be situations yep. that come up in this. Like I just ran into one where their venue, the only dates they had available did not match with me. And we did work out an associate photographer situation, but if it had, if they had not been okay with that, it would have been within their rights. And I mean, could I have refunded their deposit? I hadn't kind of gotten that far, but there could always be a situation, you know, what if you get sick and you can't shoot the wedding and you can't edit the photos and you do have to return a retainer. It's good to just kind of have that little pile set aside. And then once the wedding is over and done, like collect your income from that retainer. Yeah. Yeah. I know that, uh, uh, both, uh, Nicole and Mike do that. Um, you guys, you guys don't pay yourselves for that wedding until you've finished uh, the wedding. Um, I personally, I pay myself a set amount every month and I just leave whatever it is, is, um, is in my business account uh, for anything like this. Like if somebody needs a refund or uh, any business expenses. Um, but I know that if you guys want to touch on, on how you do things, if anybody else wants to touch on that, you can. Um. Yeah, as far as the money that we take in, Mike and I actually don't touch any of it until the job is complete, which really super sucks during the slow season. Um, but it makes sure that we're actually never touching the money that could be returned for any reason. Um, it kind of forces us to survive on the money that we do make and the money that we make at our other jobs. Um, but again, that is just kind of like a privilege that we have that we have other income. Um, but we're actually really grateful that we've set it up this way because now in a situation where we might have to return deposits if somebody's canceling their wedding we're not actually taking it out of our our personal money to be able to cancel these contracts right uh does anybody want to add to how they how they run their retainers and um do you guys all do the same thing where you uh you wait until after the wedding is done or do you you pay yourself a set amount um, and just ensure that there's enough in in an account for any any like rainy day fund or anything like that. I I do it mostly the same way as you, except for retainers. In most cases, um, I'm fine with using that money because in most cases it's non-refundable. But in this situation, I have noticed people are getting into trouble because while it's not necessarily the wrong thing to do to keep the retainer, it's also not really the right thing because people are kind of like everybody's struggling across the board so I do feel like you guys are doing a really good thing uh, Nicole where you guys are kind of making sure that you have it leveled out which I've been fortunate enough that we do have it kind of piled back over I do the same thing as you Esteban where I pay myself a certain amount every month and then keep whatever else for situations like this but I can see how if somebody doesn't have that luxury of being able to take less than what they actually make that they could get into some trouble with that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Nicole, did you have something? I don't know if you meant to, to uh, um, raise your I, hand or Lori. I had my hand up from before just um, as far as everybody's saving money. And um, I'm sure that a lot of people might not want to reach out because they are in a kind of sticky situation, especially with maybe losing your auxiliary income or maybe now you're having to return deposits. Um, I just want to put it out there that if you are food insecure, if you feel as though you can't pay your rent, if you're not going to be able to pay your bills, you can dial 211 from any phone and be directed towards assistance that can help you and make sure that you're going to be able to like feed your family, pay your rent, not lose your house. Um, so just kind of like as a general PSA out there, I know there might be people who are struggling more than we are, 
um, because we do have established businesses, but if you are struggling, there's resources out there that are available 24 seven. Just wanted to touch on that. Yeah, that's good. I actually had no idea. And I know that Garrett, you sent out uh, something where uh, there were talks of, of mortgage companies uh, doing something with your mortgage where you didn't, I don't know. I, I'm not too sure about it, but I know that maybe you can touch on it because I didn't read the story, but I know that you guys were mentioning it in the group chat. Yeah, so apparently this is this is new as of today. Um, U.S. regulators have said um, if you have a Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac mortgage, and they're expecting this to go across all lenders. If you own a home um, and you still have a mortgage on your home, that they're going to give you uh, up to a year reprieve on your mortgage payments. So um, it's not a forgiveness of your mortgage. It's um, more like a deferment that you can defer your mortgage payment for up to a year if you're affected by financially affected by this. So that's a great, uh, great thing. You can't just stop paying. You have to call your lender and have a conversation with them. Um, and they want you to call the lender and, and it sounds like it's going to be a pretty easy thing to do. Um, so yeah, definitely look into that. Yeah. So, and I, I mean, obviously that big being the biggest expense to some people is, is a mortgage. So if there's anything that, that your lender can, can help with then obviously i would definitely take advantage of that uh sean in the comments has a really which is something that i talked about uh with you guys privately which is facebook as a small business grant program um, i actually went into the website and you could just sign up for it and then once they have more information they're going to email you about it um, but yeah these are all things that some of these bigger companies are, are realizing what's happening and they're and they want to make sure that that small businesses aren't going under because of this um, so, so there are definitely resources out there for everybody to, um, to either sign up for or look into. So if anybody's struggling, I know that, uh, there's a vast, uh, majority of us are, are definitely in a position that we've never been in. So, um, so you definitely want to reach out to, to, to these people to make sure, uh, that we can get through this. So. Uh, Sarah, did you have something to say? Yeah, I was just going to say something on that same note, which I'm sure Garrett agrees with us because it's Dave mm -hmm. Ramsey. Um, but I just think a really important thing to keep in mind right now is we don't know when this has a finish line. So like you should not in any capacity feel ashamed for like asking your mortgage to hold off. You shouldn't feel like that's a thing that you should only do if you're like down to your bottom dollar. I think the most important thing right now, not knowing where the end is, is to make sure that you and your family have food and a house and a transportation and utilities so you can have the basic needs met before you start worrying about how you're going to pay that student loan or how you're going to you know, take care of all the things that are just kind of accessories that you can probably call and get pushed off for a while without any real repercussions. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Just to add to that, if you, if you prioritize food, shelter, utilities, and transportation, if you know you have that for the next two months, this could be two months, maybe a little bit longer, maybe a little bit shorter. If you prioritize food, shelter, utilities, and transportation, you're better off than a lot of people right now. So, yeah, I mean, I was actually reading some stuff online and, and, and one of the stories that I read up on, was that I think it was 70% of Americans don't have over a thousand dollars in their savings account. Um, and that's a that scary is like thought. That is 100% true. Isn't that insane? That if yeah, like it's, over it's half scary. of Americans came into $1,000 worth of hard times that they're like, they're, that they're, they're not able to cover in it. Debt. They're not able to cover it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's scary. And then obviously, even if you are in a better position, um, just thinking that as a small business owner, uh, not knowing uh, where your money's going to be coming in, um, even if you might have savings, uh, you're starting to think like, well, what's going to happen two months from now? Um, I only have this amount of money in my savings. Uh, am I going to have to dip into a retirement fund or anything like that? Where, uh, where again, those are questions that, that we're probably all asking ourselves, but, but it's a scary thought to think that, that so many people uh, don't have the luxury or, or I don't want to say privilege, but they don't, they don't have the luxury of having um, enough money in their savings account to really think that, hey, I'm not going to make it to next month. I'm not going to be able to pay because, because they're so dependent on that paycheck, the paycheck. So um, a lot of people haven't really been dealt a very good hand in their lives. So they're in a position where, I mean, right now, even though we are scared about what's going on right now, um, 
we're, we're fortunate to, to probably be in a better position than, than most people. Um, and it's just scary to think that, that there's people out there with kids. Um, I mean, even like New York city, um, I think there was like a hundred thousand students, <clears throat> excuse me, that were actually homeless and, and they were postponing closing down schools because, because they didn't know where these kids were going to eat. I know that our school, our school district, <clears throat> excuse me, um, they're providing meals to kids if, if they feel that, that they're not going to be able to eat. Um, so it's just, it's scary. Um, and, and, and again, I know that we talk about having enough of a, a savings account to be able to get through a certain amount of time. Um, but at the same time, there's people out there that, that don't have the luxury to, to, to be able to save up money that, that again, we're kind of dealt uh, a shitty hand, whether it be uh, because of the color of their skin or, or because of where they came from or because of where they're born or because of, uh, because they're not a, 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 a male. Um, and it's just kind of, it's kind of sad to, to think about that. So, um, Lori, I know that you wanted to add to whatever we were talking about. So go for it. Yeah. I think that Tony actually touched on this a little bit, but going back to like what to do during this downtime that we have, I think that doing your cost of business right now would be super beneficial if you haven't had time to sit down and do that. And that way, you know, you can adjust your pricing and price yourself accordingly to hopefully be able to have that money to put away in savings at the end of the day. Um, and I know we're all in different markets and of course our markets dictate a lot of our pricing, but doing your cost of business is really eye opening for a lot of people. And I think this is a good time to sit down and be able to do it so that going, moving on from this, we can have that cushion in place for if another catastrophe happens. Yeah. Yep. Celia, did you, are you falling asleep, Celia? Celia's falling asleep, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not falling. I'm so tired, but I'm not falling asleep. I'm listening. I We're almost done. Don't worry. I'm thinking, no, 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 no. So um, what I kind of wanted to touch base on just a little bit about what you said um, was how can we answer the question for people? So talking about how you know, okay, so I get it, like doing our cost of business, like figuring out your budget, paying yourself, you know, maybe twice a month, having those reserves. But the reality for a lot of people, A, in the beginning of, of creating a business, um, or even like for myself, you know, and, and I know you, Nicole and Mike, I don't know where everyone else is right now, but you know, who are in an area where really I'm making my income five to six months out of the year. You know, my weddings are from yeah. like June, May to October. And then you have this six months. So kind of understanding that like, basically how, how can we help people, you know, understand how to, what they can do now. We have these weddings that either need to reschedule or cancel people that have had to use the retainer to get by, to pay for a mortgage, to pay for food, because maybe they are going through a time where they don't have a second job or they have, you know, six months out of the year where they don't have a huge amount of income and they're using that retainer. You know, I guess some kind of ways to be able to help guide people on, Hey, these are things that you can do now to implement, to help kind of navigate the situation that's going on. I don't know if I'm making any sense, but I don't think everyone in this situation has the reserves to maybe replace retainers. So how can right. these people go about navigating the situation with their brides and grooms without possibly using the last of their funds that will pay for food and, you know, transportation and utilities? Um, I think that's kind of a question that's probably lingering out there that I think probably can use a little bit of, um, I don't know, a little bit of dialogue about. I mean, I think personally, I, I, the, the big thing is to, and going back to what we talked about at the beginning, which is just really giving your couples options before you get to that, that dreaded, uh, I'm going to return the retainer. Um, Lori, I know that you touched on this, maybe you can, you can talk about it a little bit more where uh, I know that you had two couples that ended up trying to reschedule for the same date, who also happened to be the date that you were supposed to be second shooting for me. So which I told you that after this live, I'm, you're going to be erased from my life, but <laughs> I guess I'll understand. And it was a beautiful wedding in Colorado too. So I don't even know what, 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 uh, okay. Well, first of all, I feel like I should say that I do have some second shooting gigs on my calendar. There are things that I pick up 
um, when I want to torture myself and work with someone like Esteban or like work with someone cool. But um, those things kind of had to fall by the, I don't want to say fall by the wayside, but you have to put your clients first at the end of the day. So I, I did offer some of those dates as like available dates to my couples that needed to postpone. And then when they selected them, I just, you know, had to let Esteban know that it's the only date that I have. I don't have a lot of Saturdays left and a lot of my weddings are postponing from Saturdays and they want future Saturdays. Um, so I think you have to be open to that. And then, yeah, I had sent out an email to two different couples with my available dates and they both chose the same date. Um, and one had literally just signed the new contract an hour before the second one reached out to me. And I was kind of like, crap, what do I do? They said it was their venue's only available date. Um, I, I, never liked the idea of having an associate shooter. I know it works for some people, but I'm a crazy control freak. So it was hard for me to think about doing that, but I did work it out. Um, I have a friend that's going to associate shoot for me. The couple was totally down with it, which was awesome. So I'm going to open that up. And that could be something that in the future helps my business. Maybe it's something I want to explore more often having associate shooters where they shoot and I do the editing. Um, and this is a great time to be networking with photographers in your community while you have that downtime to find those people that can serve as your backups, your seconds, your associates, things like that. Um, a great time to talk to people on social media, on Instagram, other photographers, and just make those connections and friendships because I'm relying on them right now. You know, I'm relying on people to be able to help me out in these situations where I don't have dates for my couple so that I don't have to refund their retainers because I can't make it work. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're, you're, you're right. And, and that's, that's scary to think that, I mean, I, I don't, I don't know if I would have handled it as well as you did, but um, to think that two couples would have wanted to to schedule on the same day is definitely a scary thought. And I never want to go through that, but, but I'm I glad that you were able to work things out. You, oh yeah. I mean, I can't imagine having to deal with that in a matter of a couple of days. Um, I was panicking. Uh, yeah. But um, luckily, also, all my couples have been super cool about it, too, which, again, comes down to that, like, open communication and just being honest with them, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Nicole, did you have something to add? I know that you had your hand up. Um, I just kind of wanted to touch on retainers a little bit because we're talking a lot about how uh, we're protecting our clients and doing right by them. But I also did want to I know it's something we've talked about in the past. Um what amount do you guys consider to be a good retainer for you guys to protect yourself within a contract? Um, I yeah, so that's actually one of the questions I got asked, that, right? Oh, yeah. A couple comments came up that people are taking like a $500 deposit, which for me, I find to be a little insecure um, as far as booking a wedding, because there's a lot of times that maybe you can get undercut by a thousand dollars by another photographer and people are still going to give up their $500 deposit and now you're out right. of wedding. Yeah. Um, so I wasn't sure what you guys thought on that. We take 50% personally. Yeah. So I, I can go first. Um, I, I also take 50%. Um, it is something that I don't think I'll ever change. Um, I know that at the end of the day, it probably has, and may have cost me a couple of weddings. Um, but I like to make sure that that we there it's enough where people aren't going to be able to back out. So, um, if for do example, you so flexible, if they say that they can't do the whole 50%, do you say like, okay, we can cut it into a couple of, payments? yeah. So if, if they initiate that, then I will. Um, but I typically just say it's a 50% uh, retainer and then the rest is due two weeks before the, uh, uh, the wedding. I know that it's something that we have both talked about where you'd recommend that I do. I mean, I've actually have offered to a couple, a couple of people because 50%, um, so on average, uh, my, my bookings are, are in like the, the 6,000 to $7,500 range. So 50% of that is a lot of money for most people. Um, so yeah, if somebody says, okay, well, well, you know, we can't afford uh, $3,500 or, or, uh, $3,000 right now, then, then yeah, I'll be able to give them the option. But, but I do think that, um, that 500 bucks is probably, uh, too little. And in my personal opinion, especially based on how my business is run, uh, 500 bucks and then having a balance of what could potentially be 6,500, $7,000. Um, that's a large exactly. chunk where you're going to, you're making it easier for them at the beginning, but then at the end you're going, all right, well now you owe me $6,000 or $6,500. And, 
Um, That's kind of what I worry about too, especially because um, I don't know if you remember referring to me and Mike, you know, that couple that you sent us that you were booked for their date. Do you remember this? No, so a couple of years ago, there was a couple, you did their engagement session. And then oh, yeah, I do remember, yeah. some other photographer um, and they left a $500 deposit with this photographer. And then they started looking through the portfolio and were like, oh my God, we didn't realize that we, this isn't our style. Um, but because it was only a $500 deposit, they ended up canceling with them and then eventually booked me and Mike. We had nothing to do with the canceling, by the way. We didn't like take $500 mm. off of their package or anything crazy like that. But it she actually happen. contacted me. So she contacted me and she, she called me. I remember specifically where I was. I was at, yeah. at, at Planet Fitness and I was doing one push-up. <laughs> and she called me. She's like, hey, listen, I, I know I was booked. And she's like, I booked this photographer from this bigger company. She's like, can you just take a look at their website and just give me your professional opinion on whether this is a bad decision that I've made or if you have somebody that, that you can recommend, um, just let me know. And I, and she sent me the website. I was at the gym. I went in the locker room and I was looking through this person's website and, and it was one of the, the bigger companies that you could tell that there was just a lot of photographers in, in their arsenal. So she didn't really know who it was. Uh, I couldn't really pinpoint. And there was just too much of a, a different rage on the quality of work. So I, I was honest with her. I said, Hey, listen, um, I personally wouldn't pay what, what, what they're, what it's costing you. Um, and I would, uh, just contact Nicole and Mike. And that's how I think I ended up getting you guys in touch. So. Um, and it, it obviously worked out for us, but on the flip side, if you were that photographer that had only asked for a $500 deposit and now three months before you were supposed to have maybe a $4,000 job, that person backs out on you. Yeah. You kept a $500 deposit, but now you might not be able to book that date and now you're kind of leaving yourself in the lurch. So. I just think it's important that people basically take enough of a deposit that you're comfortable that they're going to be willing to pay the other half of it or whatever that amount is, um, while also making it affordable for them, but not leaving yourself open to that vulnerability. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Tony, do you, do you, what do you do as far as retainers? I do 50%. I've always done 50% and never once has anyone ever balked at it. I don't know. I think as you get into higher prices, I think it's easier. I mean, I think it's easier for people just to yeah. pay that. And then you have to also think that they're probably paying their wedding venue 50%. They're probably paying a lot of other people 50%. Like that's a pretty yeah. standard deposit or retainer or whatever you want to call it. And so I don't know if, if someone came to me and said, Hey, we can't afford it. I would totally work with them. I'm not worried about it at all, but I would definitely collect more I'd, I'd collect 50 percent at least like six months prior to the wedding you know if, and um yeah I, you just got to worry about yourself and i i think people you, yeah i don't know yeah no i i agree and and i know that a lot of people do the 500 hundred dollar thing i still think that personally i i, I think that would be a little bit uh, putting myself at risk where even it's like three months before the wedding of and not that 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 they're going to go out and find a photographer that they, they like better, but just, just to give yourself that peace of mind, I feel like the retainers could probably be a little bit, a little bit higher than, than 500 bucks. But again, it's just, it's, I'm, I'm not saying that our way is the right way to do things, but, but it's definitely worked for me. And it's it also helps me find the right clients sometimes too, because if somebody's just going to throw 500 bucks at me and say, all right, well, let me just give them the 500 bucks so they can hold the date and I'll go out and keep looking. Um, then you're putting yourself in a position where somebody's gonna is gonna back out of it because maybe they found their right client or their right photographer. So, um, Sarah, did you have something to add? I'm sorry, we uh, we started talking about retainers and and. Uh -huh. No, you're okay. It's all kind of on the same uh, wavelength. I was just going to say earlier to kind of Tony's point um, about being super optimistic and having to refund the retainers. I think whenever you go into that conversation, just kind of like put all those options on the table and leave canceling out of it. Like just kind of, kind of put it out there that like, yes, this is happening, but it's going to pass and things are going to get better and you are going to have your wedding or some semblance of a wedding. And I'm going to be there for you when you do like in whatever capacity. But then also I was going to say I do, which I, I mean, I know I represent like the 
very far into like the newer people stepping into photography. So I did start out a lot lower, like 25 to 30% retainers for my weddings, which is something that I plan to change this next year. But I think for the people that are kind of scared to like charge that 50%, because I think when you're newer, it is kind of scary to tell a client like, Hey, I'm new. And also I want this much from you right now. So, but I think that's one of those things that you can kind of do, like they're going to pay you that money overall. If they really want you to be at their wedding, they're going to pay you that money overall. So that's something that you could like kind of test out and see how it goes. And if they can't afford you, you can offer payment plans, but just like try it out to start protecting yourself. I think that's in light of all this super important to know that you're going to have that money there because you're looking out for yourself first when things are going good. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I would much rather give somebody uh, the option of paying $500 a month as opposed to just a $500 retainer. Um, because again, you're putting them in that, in that position where they owe you the 500 bucks a month. And then by the time a couple of months go up, uh, then they, they have a much bigger retainer. Um, so yeah, no, I, I agree. I think, I think that's the right way to, to do it from, from what, the way that I run my business. So, uh, let's try to read some questions. If you guys have any questions, you can feel free to, I mean, we're almost done, but, um, this whole live steam or stream, uh, couldn't have come at a better time. I literally just cried to my partner on the phone for 45 minutes, for 45 minutes, uh, with this whole thing, but this is already making me feel better. Thank you all. We're glad. Um, and this is why we wanted to do this. We want to make sure that you guys all know that we're all in this together, that we'll, we're all going through the same thing where we're no better than anybody else in this group. Um, and, and if you guys have any questions about anything, um, I mean, I'm sure I can speak for everybody here. Uh, you guys can are more than welcome to DM us or post in the group. And I mean, the group is, has always taken a very supportive role. Uh, we don't really allow any negativity or anything. Uh, very rarely do we have any, anything going on where, where we need to step in or interfere with any other conversations. Um, so this is, it's a, it's a safe space. So if you guys have any questions about anything, I know that I've been on the phone a couple of times today with two photographers that have asked me for advice on what they should do. Um, and, and I'm always an open book, whether it be through, through messenger, I'll try to get back to you guys as, um, as quickly as possible. Sometimes it might take me a few days. Uh, but, but I do try to get back to everybody. So uh, I don't want you guys to think that because we're moderators and we're, we're what you would, I mean, I mean, if I look at somebody like, like Tony, like somebody that's just out there in the, the front lines, like I, I, absolutely love that about him and I know that I can constantly message him I, I talk to him all the time and and he always responds and I'm sure he'll do that for you too so um and if you want I can also post his phone number on the on the group chat so they can all call him so call me guys no call me <laughs> uh with that being said I'm I think we're just going a little bit over or we're almost getting to the hour and a half mark so I think we should probably cut it at around here, if anybody has any closing uh, comments, um, I know Celia, if you want to add anything to it, I mean, if you guys just want to all add something to it, then I would, I would love that. So. Yeah, I just, I think just wrapping everything up, kind of bringing it back to where we started um, is just remembering that this is not going to last forever. This is not something that is going to be on the forefront of our minds for, you know, the rest of our careers. Um, so just remembering to show up for our clients and our audience and the people that we love and that love us every day, whether it's sharing photos or even just showing up live and talking about your experiences, staying in your people's feeds, being on the forefront, being in people's minds, you know, um, it doesn't even have to be sharing photography. Like I did a live this morning with my son, Oliver, and read a book. I did a little story time, you know, for families who are all cooped up. Just ask yourself, how can, how can I serve others? There are so many other ways that you can stay present in people's feeds um, without marketing. And there is a quote that I heard the other day that is so true that I think we can all just really resonate on. It was, um, the words we attach to our experience defines our experience. So remembering how we go about through this dark time, the words we put out there is what people are going to be clinging on to. 
So let's be the helpers. Let's be the guiders. Let's be the people who are shedding light in this experience. And, and that's going to draw people to us manifesting, you know, positivity and all that good, all that good hippie Vermont stuff, you know, so, (laughs) (laughs) but yeah, I think that uh, it's important. It's important to kind of shed some light in some dark times. So that's my closing statement. I'm so honored that you guys asked me to be here. I look up to each and every one of you on this panel. I admire your work and your passion and your drive. And so I just want to say thank you so much for always being so supportive and for having me tonight. It's been a great honor. So thank you. Thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Uh, yeah, does anyone else have anything to Also, just thank you for allowing us to be on here. And same thing that Celia said, like, we'll get through this and a year from now we'll look back and our businesses will be better than ever. I think, you know, we'll learn and we'll grow and it'll be okay. I believe it. We work too hard to let this go. So just stick with it. Yeah, that's, that's huge. We work too hard to let this go. And, and even though times get tough and we try to question each, uh, ourselves and we try to question what's going to happen. Um, I mean, I know that when I started my business, I had a lot of sleepless nights where, where I wondered whether I should, really be doing this or whether I should go out and, and, and find another job. And the one thing that, that I consistently did, which is kind of push through everything, even though at times I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know how tomorrow would be or how a month from now would be. I mean, I've gone through this in a much different situation, but, but I've gone through it. And, and the, the big thing is to just really keep pushing and, and knowing that again, like we first started the conversation, there is, that light at the end of the tunnel. And, and I know that, that, that if we do keep pushing, we'll, we'll get through it and, and we'll look back at it as a learning opportunity and, and we'll, we'll be able to adapt so that we don't go through it again. Or at least if we do go through it again, we go through it in a much different, different way and a much different attitude. So 